TorahCafe.com. Three years ago, I spoke at the retreat on the theme. The title was essentially The Challenge of the Jew in the 21st Century. That was supposed to be today's title as well. But back then, I reflected, in fact, on the two very real threats that face the collective Jewish or the global Jewish community as they face us both outward and inward. The challenges of anti-Semitism and that very threat that we face outward, if you like, incorporating the delegitimization of Israel, etc., and very much at the same time the challenges of internal strife and all the different labels and titles and denominations that we have and all that unnecessary inner squabbling that tends to so manifest itself. What I want to do today is something very different. I want to actually reflect on an altogether different dynamic. Call it, if you like, the challenge of the Jew in the 21st century, part two. Lots of films have sequels, right? Batman just came out with a whole new kind of film, etc. So why not focus on a lecture topic especially one that goes right to the core, the essence of who we are as individuals, of what we represent as Jews, whether indeed to ourselves or in fact the world. And let me begin by telling you that if I wasn't to become a rabbi, and I was never always intending to become a rabbi, my father, in fact, may he be well, is among one of six brothers. His father was a chief rabbi. In fact, going back two centuries, there was a straight chain of rabbis. And when my grandfather was asked of his six sons, five of which became rabbis, and one a very successful businessman, your six boys, tell me, what are they? He says, five are rabbis, and one is a mensch. <laughs> and all my life, my father was always yelling at me as I was growing up, Zay a mensch, be a mensch, be a mensch. So I thought that was kind of a message, you know, anything other than a rabbi. And if I wasn't going to become a rabbi, I would have, in all likelihood, become perhaps a sociologist. I love to sit and watch people. Lunchtime, dinner time, if you see me staring at you, don't feel awkward. It's just what I do. I like to simply observe people, the little episodes, the little nuances. I just find myself naturally doing that. Um, because sometimes there are so many different little things that go on around us that we might otherwise be inclined to overlook or just simply smile at cutely or what have you. But I'll ask myself, why did that just happen? Or what life lesson can I derive therefrom? So take, for example, a certain individual. His name is Lawrence. Lawrence has a lot of faith in his rabbi. That's me. He came to me at a kiddush several years ago, and he told me he was about to lease the basement, the large ground floor, in the Merrill Lynch building in the city in London. That was going to cost him several hundred thousand pounds. And he wanted my reassurance and my blessing, if you like, that he'll be successful in the menswear shop that he was hoping to open over there. I made it simple. I said, Lawrence, close on Shabbos and you'll be successful. All these years on, I can tell you two things. The first thing is that Lawrence is, Baruch Hashem, making an absolute fortune in that store. The second is that I could never pay retail again ever for a suit. I mean, he'll give me the suits at what it costs him for 80 to 110 pounds, and yet he has them all on sale for 450 to 500 pounds, and all those Merrill Lynch boys and girls are coming downstairs every time there's a sale thinking they're getting a bargain. Now, Lawrence came to me once rather perplexed also because the ladies' suit store that he opened three doors away didn't quite take off, and he had to close it six months later. I looked at him and explained simply, Lawrence, you never asked me for a blessing for that store. He thought about it, then he told his friends about it, and now I've got this whole groupie following that come to me looking for blessings. <laughs> But the reason I'm telling you this is because several months ago, Lawrence asked me for another blessing. He bought a race horse called Maravana, and he wanted my blessing that his horse should do well. This, by the way, was again at a Shabbos Kiddush. I don't know if it's the whiskey or what, but I gave him a blessing, this time with an altogether different proviso. 
I said to him that, Lawrence, provided that 10% of your winnings goes to a charity of my choice. He agrees, we shake, we say l'chaim, and that's that. Two weeks later, honest to goodness truth, I get a phone call from Lawrence. Rabbi, go to your nearest computer, go on this particular racing website, and I want you to watch the rerun of a, of a race. And so I did as I was told. He was staying on the line to talk me through and that I should listen. And he wants to listen as I'm observing over this. And he tells me where to go. He tells me to watch. His horse at 40 to 1 odds is trailing in ninth place. Then in seventh. Then in fifth. And to cut a long story short, his horse at 40 to 1 odds is in first place with the favorite trailing just right behind him. And I'm thinking, wow. We wow. I know Lawrence. I know he's a gambler. The minimum he would have put down on his horse is a thousand pounds. That's forty thousand in his winnings, four thousand pounds for a charity of my choice. Six, seven thousand dollars, whatever it is. His horse is pulling away ahead. His horse wins by ten lengths. And the next part of the conversation goes like this Rabbi, guess how much I bet? And my heart is beating excitedly, and I dare to ask, how much? He says, nothing. It was Shabbos. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I quickly realize, oops, no, 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 I mean Lawrence, of course, of course, well done, well done, good for you. <laughs> and just like that, 4,000 pounds disappeared into dream stuff. <laughs> and to think I was going to donate it to JLI. If there is a lesson that I learned from that story, it is that the lessons you teach others, they stay with them, always. Maybe this time the deal was about money, was about charity, but Lawrence remembers all those years ago, the first deal and the first lesson from all those years earlier, and he knows that the success of his business was contingent also on him doing what is his responsibility as a Jew. So don't keep it open on Shabbos. And so that here too, even as his horse is racing on Shabbos, he's not going to put money on it. And thus I am 4,000 pounds poorer for the experience, but equally that much more, if you like, spiritually enriched, because it is always reassuring when you discover that the life lessons you taught another are still being adhered to, acted upon, lived by. And there are a lot of lessons that we learn in life. And maybe somewhere along the way, as we get older, we become that little bit more discerning. We pick and choose maybe which lessons conform to our life's model and which might, in fact, cramp our style. And so Lawrence could have easily told himself, the rabbi never said anything about Shabbos for my horse. He spoke only about money, only about charity. But then... He would just be fooling himself, wouldn't he? And yet I suggest to you that we're all, all of us, without exception, masters at fooling ourselves, deluding ourselves with all sorts of convenient excuses that pacify our consciences over our shortcomings, convincing ourselves of what we might not have to do. And I want to focus a little bit on this unusual phenomenon because, you know, with each passing generation, we're always that much further away from Sinai, from the very initial event of the giving of the Torah, when we were proclaimed God's regal nation, and we knew and we understood and we integrated what it means to be a Jew, with all the great responsibility that comes with it. It's a fact that the closer you are to source, the more connected you feel. The more distant you are, the less connected you might feel. There is still always a magnetic field between the central magnet and the one that I might be holding at a distance, but the further away that I'm holding it, of course, the less pull does it feel. The Mishnah and Ethics of the Fathers tells us that every single day a voice emanates from Mount Sinai and summons us back towards our greater Jewish calling, our greater Jewish responsibility. So the question then is this, if we don't hear the voice, then what's the point in its calling? And the Baal Shem Tov explained, even as we don't hear the voice today, 
our neshamas, our precious souls, certainly do. Yes, there was a point earlier in time when we all stood there, we all heard that voice loud and clear, a first-hand experience. But now that we've drifted physically further away from the mountain, and now 3,324 years on, we're all that distance away, your soul, it's always there. It's always connected. It always still hears it. The question is, how deaf are we to the calling? How much time has elapsed that perhaps now we, collectively, might feel, as a Jewish nation, more apathetic? I want to leave that thought for a moment and go back even still further in time to that all original story at the beginning of time with the creation of the universe. Let's consider, after creating heaven and earth, God created Adam and Eve. And the first thing God said was, don't. Don't what? Adam replied, God replied, don't eat the forbidden fruit. Forbidden fruit? Wow, hey, we have forbidden fruit. Hey, Eve, guess what? We have forbidden fruit. No way, yes way. God says, don't eat the fruit. Why? Well, we all know the answer to that. We've all heard it when we were kids. Because I'm your father and I said so. God says, wondering perhaps why he didn't stop creation after the elephants. And a few minutes later, God sees his children having an apple break. And boy, was he angry. He says, didn't I tell you not to eat the fruit? What's the first thing Adam does? He points to Eve. He shifts the blame on her. She started it. Did not. Did too. Did not. And having had it with the two of them, God's punishment was that Adam and Eve should have children of their own, and thus the pattern was set, and it's never changed. <laughs> and of course, Eve shifts responsibility onto the snake, etc. Think about this for a minute. I know I may have trivialized the story somewhat, but aren't we essentially guilty of the same? Don't we look to shift responsibility? To blame our shortcomings on everything but our own selves. See, today in the 21st century, we have essentially stopped taking responsibility. Kids today blame everything on their parents and their upbringing. I'm a victim of circumstance, they cry. It's got nothing to do with me. It's not my fault. What is it they tell about the three Jewish mothers that are sitting together at the Miami Beach and... The conversation typically turns to their children as it does, and the first one says, my son treats me so well. Last winter he gave me an all-expenses-paid holiday to the Bahamas. It was a machaya. The second one says, you think that's something? My son bought me a new house and a stretch limo with a chauffeur at my disposal to take me wherever I want to go. And the third looks and says, ach, all you yachnes, you don't know what you're on about. You think you guys got something? My son... He goes to a psychiatrist once a week at $100 an hour, and all he talks about is me. <laughs> Husbands and wives blame one another when their relationship breaks down. He didn't spend enough time with me. She stopped caring about me. We're always shifting the blame onto somebody else without necessarily looking inward. Adults just blame their jobs, their time constraints, the stresses, the anxieties, and the rat race which they had the misfortune to have to be born into. I can't come to show this weekend, I'm so burdened with life. Every successive government blames its shortfalls on the previous government. The economy is where it is because of all of the debt accumulated by the previous administration. There's always the finger of blame pointing at the other without much realization as to the four fingers that are essentially pointing back at oneself. But all these blame games, they all add up to the same thing. Apathy. Not just that you can't be bothered. It's more, and to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, that you genuinely believe you can't, full stop. I can't do it. Blame my mother, blame my husband, blame my kids, blame whoever you want. But the bottom line is, I can't. There's a little gremlin inside you and me. Some know him as the devil. Others call him the Yetzirah. We tend to typically refer to him as the evil inclination. And Jewish <coughs> tradition maintains that your evil inclination gets a head start in life. He starts his initial descent and right away is there, programmed inside your psyche, your, conscious, your consciousness, 
from the moment of birth. Your good inclination also begins his descent into you, if you like, from for a boy, from a girl from the time she's born, from a boy from the time of his brit milah, from his circumcision, but culminates that descent only at the time of the bar and bat mitzvah. And that's when the real battle ensues. You know, let me give you an example. You're all here now learning for several intense days, and I think it's, of course, a beautiful thing. Learning is stimulation of the brain, which in turn is stimulation of the soul. And I'm sure beyond here, of course, many of you will attend regular classes during the course of the whole year as well. That feeling that you get, when one night you tell yourself, I can't really be bothered tonight. That's that little inclination, that little devil inside you fighting for, for, for supremacy. That's the threat or the challenge of apathy as it presents itself. You'll validate your excuse. You'll find what to blame it on. And maybe even, in fact, for this one night, you are right. But I'm sure many can readily attest as to how one night turns to two and two turns to four, and so it goes from there. And at some point, we look back and we wonder, when did it all stop? It stopped when you decided, I can't. And for whatever the reasons, and for whatever the excuses that you gave yourself, and so too with many other spiritual responsibilities. When did my daughter stop coming to the table on Friday night? When I decided I can't tell them what to do anymore. When did my son start mixing with the wrong crowd? When I decided I can't tell him what to do. The greatest gift that God gave mankind is the power of intellect. And throughout life, we stimulate that intellect. As children, we exercise our brains through the education that we are given. As adults, we do so through the work that we're engaged in. It is precisely that power of intellect that separates man from animal and enables us to exercise our free choice. The Torah says right from the outset, God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. What does it mean that we were created in the image of God? We're corporal. We're finite. God is infinite. He's immortal. Obviously, the image of God is dealing with the non-physical part of oneself, the neshama, the soul. Where do we get that drive for morality? Where do we get our sense of right and wrong? Where do we get our motivation to want to make a difference? That comes from the soul, which is in the image of God. But even more so, much more so, just as God has independent choice, when it says we were created in the image of God, it means that he has gifted us also with free choice. Every human being, without exception, has independent moral choice. Having been created in the image of God means that you have the ability to choose. Why is choice the essential issue that makes us special? Because when you think about it, life only ever becomes meaningful based on the choices that you can make. For example, the difference between choosing to love or being programmed to love is precisely that which makes love significant. Similarly, if I don't have a choice to do good, but I'm programmed to do good, there's nothing meaningful about it. And for the Jew, the choices extend beyond just the basic parameters of morality. They come into play in all the nitty-gritty of every dimension of your life. And all through life, I have one choice to make, and that's the choice that we are faced from the moment we open our eyes till the moment we close them at night. Can I or can't I? Do I listen to the good inclination that is motivating me and spurring me on? Or do I cave to the dictates of the evil inclination and tell myself simply, I can't? And here's the catch. You see, if the image of God that we spoke of is linked to both the souls that we contain as well as the choices exercised through our thinking process, then the soul and the brain are inextricably linked. Our souls are essentially stimulated through the conscious decisions that we make. You might think right now that the choices don't make any ultimate difference. 
but the hard fact is that they impact on your soul and all those who are an extension of your soul. Man is comprised of mind, body, and soul. And the surest way to ensure a vibrant and energetic life is by using your mind to make the right choices such that you execute them accordingly and that in turn fires up your soul and those around you. And that's what makes you feel alive as a Jew and as a human being. Deny yourself that and you're pretty much on a one-way ticket to Never Never Land. You know, they tell of this very old Jewish man of German descent who emigrated and he um, called his rabbi just as he was lying there on his bed before he was to pass on. And the rabbi came to, say, to attend to him and he says, look, I, I need to get something off my chest. Towards the end of World War II, I took pity on a German soldier and I gave him refuge in my garden shed. And the rabbi looked at him and said, listen, you know what? At the end of the day, you were showing compassion and amity. That's a natural Jewish attribute. It's fine. It's okay. He says, but Rabbi, actually, I was charging him a hundred Deutschmarks for every week that he stayed in my garden shed. And the rabbi looked at him again and said to him, you were hiding him. You were risking your life for him. You're entitled to some compensation. And the old man says, thank you, Rabbi. That eases my mind. Just, just one more thing. He says, sure, what is it? He goes, you think before I die, I should tell him that the war is over? <laughs> There is a war being fought out there in the world today. And God put you and me into this world to grapple with it, to take on our slice of the world, to battle against the whims and the dictates of a laissez-faire society and to do what we can in every which way possible to transform our world, to make it the better place that it was always intended to be, to make it good forever. Let me ask you something. Who exactly reserves the right to tell us that the war is over? In which book, in which Bible, in which life manual does it declare that at some point in your life you're no longer responsible to learn more, to do more, to continue weaving your end of the fabric in your slice of the world? Abraham was 75 when God first challenged him to move from his land, his birthplace, and his father's home to the land which I will show you. There are three things that mold the character of an individual. Your father's home, namely your gene pool, what you inherit from your mother and father. Your birthplace, namely your innate qualities, the quirks and the idiosyncrasies that make up that are unique to your personality. And your land, namely the society in which you live the culture and the traditions by which you are exposed and which superimpose on some of your natural instinct. God tells Abraham to leave all three. Abraham, and by extension you and me, is being instructed by God that at no point in your life do you have to capitulate and tell yourself, this is who I am, this is all I can be. God is telling Abraham, and by extension you and me, that you can move beyond all that, that you can transcend all that. Whether at 25 or 65, for as long as you are here, you clearly still have a purpose to serve. Otherwise, dare I say it, somebody up above would pull the plug. You'd no longer be. And for as long as you are here and you have a purpose to serve, then every one of us has a responsibility to seek and to explore and to determine where else and how else I can make a very real difference. At no point until the song is over do we have a right to stop playing our pivotal role in the orchestra of life. So long as the conductor continues to beckon to you, you keep blowing your trumpet. That's really the way God wanted it already right from the beginning. He wanted man, as we know, when putting him in Garden of Eden, in paradise, to live forever. He provided him that very paradise in which to experience that eternity. Within that paradise, man pretty much messed up. He could have experienced spiritual utopia, but when he regrettably didn't do what he was supposed to do, he squandered that opportunity. He had only one choice to make. God said, don't eat from the tree, and he decided, I can't. And so he made the wrong one. And then he shifted the blame 
right away somewhere else. And you and me, in our world today, we've been challenged with the responsibility of having to rectify that mistake. And we are given countless opportunities within our own immediate surrounds, within our own families, within our own communities, and wherever else we might find ourselves, in which we can make good what Adam messed up by taking responsibility for our lives, for the choices we make. Abandoning the excuses and telling yourself, I can, and thereby really bringing a part of paradise and heaven once again back down to earth. I wonder if I may take you on a trip back to your early childhood. You'll remember pressing your nose up against the window pane, looking out in wonderment, imagining what the world holds in store for you. You gaze out at that big blue sky. Your breath is fogging up on the window all around you. You're wondering with excitement what it must be like to be grown up, to be an adult. And then before you know it, you're on the other side of the glass with your nose peering in. And you're looking inward and you see an image of yourself, an innocent child, surrounded by the warmth and the love of your parents, stress-free, not a care in the world, only curiosity, mystery, awe, gazing out of this vast universe, wondering what lurks out there, what secrets does life yet hold in store for you. So today, we press our noses up against the windows of our lives, and we look in and we reminisce and we consider the journey that we traveled so far. Many of us will have traveled and lived through enough years to know that our noblest dreams have a persistent habit of falling by the wayside. Sometimes it would seem the loftier our aspirations are and the more firmly we resolve to adhere to them and to approach them, the more quickly we seem to lose our way. And then the more quickly we assume this presumed limitation. We assume this presumed lack of strength, our lack of discipline, our lack of motivation, it could easily feel as though we were worse off before we chartered that ambitious course for self-improvement. Do you ever wonder why God made us such that we have to first crawl before we could walk? Why not make life simple? Give us the ability and wherewithal to simply walk from the word go. Just hop off the birthing table and walk out of the labor ward holding your mom's hand. Well, do you remember the first time you started to walk? Do you remember how many times you fell and that voice of your mother or father calling to you, challenging you, come on, you can do it. Maybe God wants us to undergo that whole original experience at the earliest possible stages of our lives so that that same voice echoes and reverberates within our souls all through life. At whatever juncture, when we hit life's speed bumps, whether in relationships, whether at work, whether in life, and overall in our challenges as a Jew, and maybe we fall, but that same voice is there, and it's cajoling us to pick ourselves up and walk again. You know, some 39 years ago, I had a second grade teacher who observed me fretting over a very difficult mathematical piece and my inability to complete it. And she declared rather firmly, and it always stuck in my head, Yitzchak Shachet, there's no such thing as I can't. Now, to be sure, I've since come to discover that some sages about 2,000 years before her coined a similar phrase, albeit in a more positive context. There is nothing that can stand in the way of true will. The great Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov was once delivering a discourse in the cramped study hall in Mezebush when a wagon driver was passing by in the muddy rain outside and found himself trapped. His wheel got stuck. So he went inside and he approaches the first disciple on hand and says, listen, I'm wondering if you can step out for a minute and help me pull my wheel. And the guy is like, shh, shh. And he points to the Baal Shem Tov. He's speaking now. He says, look, I know, I know, but it's only going to take two minutes. I just need a little push. He goes, pointing ahead again, like, shush, shush. 
The guy looks, he looks around, he's perplexed. He needs to be on his way. So he looks again, goes, just do me a favor, just, just two minutes, that's all I'm asking of you. And the guy looks back to him and says, I can't right now, I, don't you understand, I can't. And the wagon driver recoils, looks to him and says to him in Russian, can you can, only you don't want to. At which point the Balshemtov interrupted the discourse, pointed to what the wagon driver had just said and said, you know what he said just now, is teaching you a more important lesson than anything I could ever possibly teach you right here and now. When summoned at the burning bush to become the bona fide leader of the people, three times Moses says to God, I can't. And then the Torah says, Vayichar af Hashem, Moshe. God became outraged, incensed against Moshe. If I present you with the challenge, then clearly you can. God doesn't overimpose upon his creation. If the task presents itself to you, then that is your burning bush moment in which you are able to respond to what God is calling on you to do. Because at that precise moment, God is saying to you, here is an opportunity for you to celebrate like never before your own power, your own ability to get yourself to do whatever it is. You know, it was always believed that you can never run a mile in under four minutes, always. And in 1954, Roger Bannister, British, ran the first mile in under four minutes. That same year, three other people thereafter also ran a mile in under four minutes. What changed? The asphalt didn't change. The atmosphere didn't change. This changed. When one man demonstrated that it could be done, everybody else suddenly realizes that it could be done as well. Because impossible is just an opinion. It's not a fact. Life is all about advancement. Life is all about progress. When we're now in this fast-paced, moving 21st century, it's about never standing still. If you stagnate, you degenerate. The moment you make a conscious decision not to progress, then invariably you do regress. It may not be immediate, it may not be instantly discernible, but it is inevitable. And God is the wind beneath the wings of our souls, enabling us to climb ever higher. The famous biblical Joseph was trapped in the depths of Egyptian servitude. Life seemed all but over. Could you imagine if he would have said, I can't, but in the end, of course, he emerges as viceroy in Egypt, whilst all the Egyptian persecutors ran out in the sea. How many Jews in former Soviet Union sat languishing in gulags? Imagine if they would have said, I can't. And how many of them have now gone on to build Hasidic dynasties, families, children, grandchildren, revolutionizing all parts of the world? And you and me, we get oppressed by the limitations of our own imaginations or the dictates of a society that says you can't. And the challenge is then for us to go and search for the hero inside ourselves and continue to nurture ourselves at every interval in life constantly progressing, always moving upward, aiming ever higher. You know, Mr. Goldstein stopped coming to Shul one week. And one, after a little while, the rabbi goes to see him. He says, why aren't you coming to Shul anymore? He says, Rabbi, he goes, you know, all the time ago I turned 90 years old. He goes, of course I remember. I was at the Kiddush. He goes, I thought that was it. 90 years, it's great. Time's up. He goes, so? He goes, next thing I knew, I turned 95. And I thought, bonus, five years, great. And the rabbi's like, okay, and what's your point? He goes, well, as you know, I turned 100. I celebrated my century. I got a letter from the queen. It was really special, and I knew at this point, any day now. And the rabbi looks at him and goes, what's your point? He says, rabbi, a few weeks ago, I turned 105. I'm convinced that God has forgotten about me. I'm not going back into Shul to remind him. <laughs> we live in a world today where many people believe that God has forgotten about us. We live in a world today that is so riddled by chaos, where people live on the edge, where people go for the extreme. You want to drive a faster car, you want to climb a higher mountain, you want to push yourself to the max. Today everything has to be newer, flasher, wilder, more amazing, more shocking, more disturbing, more expensive, more groundbreaking. We live in a world that pushes its boundaries, that doesn't like to maintain a status quo that needs new degrees of sensationalism just to keep people remotely interested. And look at the effects. So you get today road rage and plane rage and even checkout rage and youth rage, age rage, new names for extreme new syndromes that encapsulate the corrosive impatience and 
instant anger, which is just another feature of our wanted now, wanted faster, wanted better world. But the truth is that for hundreds of years, perhaps since the beginning of time, God put aside a little piece of this world waiting for you and your soul to encounter it, to affect with it, to repair it, to engage with that little part of the world and to spell with whatever darkness lurks therein, with goodness and kindness, bringing the message to everyone, Jew and non-Jew alike, that God has not forgotten about you. That was the uniqueness of Abraham, as we referred to before. God said, lech lecha, go, keep moving, don't be afraid of change. Ela aretz asher to the land which I will show you. Don't be afraid of the unknown. Confront every challenge as it presents itself. Keep climbing higher because the greatest tragedy in life is not aiming too high and missing, it's aiming too low and reaching. You know, our rabbis challenge us with an interesting problem. They say, each of us should ask ourselves, when will my actions, my ways, reach to the levels of that of my ancestors? By definition, when will I be able to become like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Or like Rachel, like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah? I mean, is that an unrealistic standard? Are they setting me up for the fall? Do they genuinely believe that I can become like them? that I can become a forefather, I can become a matriarch. They're great men, great women, written about in the greatest book by God himself. And the answer lies on a well-known story about Rav Zusha Vanapol, who always said, when he comes upstairs to the heavenly realm and they were to ask him, Zusha, on earth, why were you not like Abraham? He says, I'll have an answer. Abraham, God, you appeared to him, you never appeared to me. Why were you not like Isaac? Isaac, you gave him a chance to sacrifice himself on the altar, you never gave me that opportunity. Why were you not like Jacob? Jacob, father of the 12 tribes. I only had a couple of kids. Whoever they ask me, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, I'll have a ready answer. There's only one question, which if they ask me, I won't have an answer for. And that is if they say to me, Zusha, why were you not like Zusha? You see, Rab Zusha is teaching us the importance of having an authentic identity. God didn't make us to be like everybody else. If he intended for me to be Superman, he wouldn't have made me into Clark Kent. Each of us is supposed to be Zusha or Chaim or whatever your name may be. Our job is not to imitate the success of others, but to discover our own unique mission in this world. Because God doesn't duplicate. He put me in this world in order to be a Yitzchak Shachet, not an Abraham. He already made an Abraham and he already had one. And thus, when the rabbis challenge us and they say, we should ask ourselves, when will I be like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What they're effectively saying is, just like they aspired to be all that they can be. I must do the same with regard to my own self as well. I must seek out without my, within my own life my daily patterns that constantly daily express my moral fiber. You know, Beethoven started to go deaf at the age of 20, and he still went on to compose masterpieces. Mozart started playing music at three, and he composed already at five. They're gifted. They have a unique talent. Does that mean that I cannot be a brilliant musician? Maybe, I won't know till I try. In all likelihood, I could become good, maybe even real good, but I don't have their musical ability. I wasn't born with that nature. And me, they, maybe I may be tone deaf. Why them, not me? That's God's business. But so far as I'm concerned, God made me to be as great as I can be. I could be brilliant in a million other ways. They tell this wonderful story. It was the greatest trial, biggest trial in a decade in a small town in, somewhere in Detroit. And all the people turned out to watch the proceedings. And at one point, a grandmotherly, elderly woman is called to the stand. And uh, Mr. Williams, the prosecutor, approaches and he looks to her and he says, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? She says, of course I know you. I've known you since you were a little kid. You've been a big disappointment to me. You are a bigot. You are unfaithful. You're also something of a racist, and you run a really lousy law practice. Yeah, I know you. She doesn't know what to do. She, he doesn't know what to do, Mr. Williams. He's gobsmacked. He says, I'm Mrs. Jones. He points across to the defense attorney. He goes, do you know Mr. Bradley? She says, of course I know Mr. Bradley. I used to babysit him for his parents. He's got a drinking problem. His parents never knew about his drug taking. 
He thinks he's going to amount to a big shaft of some sort, but he's never going to be more than a two-bit paper pusher himself. Yeah, I know Mr. Bradley as well. At which point the judge bangs his gavel hard on his desk and he summons both lawyers forward. And he whispers very softly but very menacingly, if either of you even think about asking her whether she knows me, I'll have you in contempt of court. <laughs> what sort of reputation do we strive for in life? If we're going to be put on the stand one day, how do we want other people to know us, to describe us, to remember us? Because remember, God isn't going to ask if you ran a public company. He's going to want to know if you built, made an effort in building a loving home filled with Jewish values. He's not going to ask you why you didn't succeed in solving the world's problems. He'll ask simply whether you care for your neighbor. And above all else, God is not going to ask how much you necessarily believed in him. But he will want to know if you ever stopped believing in yourself. You have to believe in yourself, not just as an individual, but as a Jew. You need to be aware of your abilities in order to best nurture them and apply them to your life's plan and model. A humble but reasonable confidence in your own powers enables you to be successful and happy, and when you have that, you've got the world in your pocket. So it's not enough to just simply think Jewish, nor is it enough to merely feel Jewish. Every single Jew has to realize their true potential and justify their whole purpose for being, and in order to do so, you have to act Jewish. The beauty of the human spirit is that it is comprised of three fundamental faculties, machshava, dibur, and masa, intellect, speech, and action. And as an intelligent, thinking, imaginative being, man has all sorts of thoughts flashing constantly through his mind. Even sublime thoughts, but they don't last. For thoughts to have lasting meaning, you have to distill them into words and translate them into action. Because the process of thought culminates when ideas are expressed and clarified. I had another teacher, grade four, who explained to us in elementary terms what the definition of hell is in the afterlife. I'll never forget that either. He said, you'll be shown two pictures, one of what you became and one of what you could have become. And frankly, there can be nothing more painful than that. You know, it's one thing, when you play the lottery every single week and you keep playing the same numbers every week, and one week you choose not to play the numbers, and that week the numbers come up, imagine how that feels. Only at least with the lottery and however many billion to one odds, you can keep playing the numbers and maybe one day they'll come up. But there, when you're shown those two images, it's too late. This is the world of where you can still be all that you can be. Richard Nixon once explained why his predecessor and rival John Kennedy was so loved whilst he was so despised. And he said, when people looked at Kennedy, they see what they want to be. When people look at me, they see what they are. God, as we said, never overimposes on his creation. But he has defined a specific role for every single one of us with exclusive accomplishments unique to our individuality. There is something I can do that no one else can do. There is someone I can become that no one else can become. Because whilst God created everything en masse, a multitude of stars, vast oceans, an abundance of vegetation, and an entire animal kingdom, man was created alone, singular, so that he can say, for me, was this world created? And if the world was created for me, then I can do something with it, that I can make something of it. What you become, that is preordained from above. Whether you become it, that comes down to your free choice to how much you maximize your potential, to the extent that you grab life as it presents itself with both hands and you run with it. Because if Abraham can do it, and if Sarah can do it, and their successors can do it, then you and I can do it too. Life is all about getting excited when opportunity presents itself. Too many people would rather be miserable than risk being happy. If you allow yourself to be enthusiastic, you'll realize how much wonder you are filled with. You won't care what other people think. You have to be like the turtle. If he didn't stick his neck out, he wouldn't get anywhere at all. So you find life sometimes difficult. I say to you, it's not because things are difficult that we don't try, it's because we don't try that they're difficult. You find that one added spiritual undertaking threatening, I say to you, every shot you don't take is a guaranteed miss. 
You find reaching beyond your comfort zone too risky. I say to you, if you don't risk anything, you risk even more. If you ask yourself sometimes, and we all do, whether there's really any point, the bottom line is God in the world will, re God in the world will reward you and me for taking risks on his behalf. You know, the Medrash tells us how on the way down from Mount Moriah, following the famous test of the sacrifice of the Akedah, our forebear Isaac was silent, contemplative, meditative, looked up to his father Abraham and said, you know, father, it seems that God asks too much of his creation. Reflecting on his own experience, he said, perhaps indeed too much for some to fulfill. And Abraham pondered the profundity of his son's remark and then said to him, true, my son, God's demands are much like the mountain peak, which, are, which stand above us. Not everyone may reach its summit, as we have just done. But all of mankind must keep climbing, reaching ever upward as long as a breath of life is still within. We may never be perfect, Abraham concluded to his son, but our goals and our ambitions must be. You see, contrary to common perception, most people are in fact not failures. They just start at the bottom and they like it there. And then after that, sometimes maybe they just tell themselves, I can't. But the vast opportunities that are there are for us to keep searching of yet grander goals of greater meaning and enduring fulfillment. Before your soul entered this world, it undertook an oath of life. It committed itself to fulfilling a purpose. Then events took over, and we're like diamonds in the rough, and we spend a lifetime removing whatever it is that belies the inherent beauty and the priceless gem of our spiritual essence. It's all about finding our way back, peeling away the layers that we may have otherwise allowed to blur our vision and our dream. A man came home once quickly from work and he tells his wife, honey, quick, get me a drink. And he sits down, she gets up, she gets him a drink. He drinks it. He says, quick, quick, get me another one. It's gonna start any minute. She goes, okay, she goes and gets him another drink. He downs that too. He says, honey, honey, quick, get me one more, one more. It's gonna start any second now. She gets up, she's very perturbed. She gets him another drink. He goes, honey, please, just one more. It's going to start now. It's going to start now. She looks and goes, is this all you're going to do? Just sit here and order me and boss me around and that's it? He goes, ah, it started. <laughs> Life isn't starting any minute now. Life isn't starting any second now. The course of Jewish history started with the onset of our exodus from Egypt and the Torah at Sinai. Yes, we are, as I said at the outset, much further away from that point in time when we were first brought into being and we were first given that special charge to be a light onto the nations. But to the flip side, we're that much closer to the other end, to the culmination of our mission. For more than 3,000 years, we've been trekking ever closer and ever sooner towards the apex, the conclusion of our purpose, the completion of the mission, the salvation of our world as promised by God through all the prophets. It's not as if we can all just sit around and wait for it to happen. We have to make it happen, we can make it happen. And each of us, regardless of who we are and at whatever stage in our lives, have a pivotal role to make it happen because we all have greatness within, we all contain something special, and we need to sometimes sit back and take a look inward to discover our own uniqueness and what difference we can actually make to the world. And then we become champions and heroes to others as well. Let me conclude, because I've just been given my five minute notice, by finishing off with a light-hearted observation. You know, the only time in your life when you like to get old is when you're a kid. If you're less than 10 years old, you're so excited about getting older that you think in fractions. How old are you? I'm four and a half. You're never 36 and a half. You're four and a half going on five. That's the key. Then you're in your teens and you can't hold back. You jump to the next number or even many numbers ahead. How old are you? I'm going to be 60. You could be 13, but you're going to be 60. And then the greatest day of your life, you become 21. Even the words sound like a ceremony. You become 21. You've arrived. Where? I don't know. But you've arrived. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that you've become 21. And then, then you turn 30. Oi. What happened there? It makes you sound like sour milk. It turned sour or he turned 30. You have to get ready to throw him out. And then you're pushing 40. Then you have to put on the brakes. It's all slipping away. Before you know it, you reach 50, and that's it. It's all over. 
You haven't quite made it up until now. You've reached this point, and that's it. Your dreams have all but dissipated. And then what do you know? You make it to 60. It's like you've made it beyond the point that you ever necessarily imagined you were going to arrive at. You've navigated a jungle through life. You've trekked a mountain. You've run a marathon, and now you've made it. You've made it to 60, even if you didn't think you would. By the time, so let's just recap very quickly. You become 21, you turn 30, you push 40, you reach 50, you make it to 60. Life has been such a rush, you built up so much speed that you hit 70. And after that, it's day by day thing. I hit Monday, I'm doing good. I've just made Wednesday. By the time you get into your 80s, every day is like a complete cycle. You hit lunch, you turn 4.30, you reach bedtime. And by the time you hit your 90s, then something's happened. You start to regress. Once you're in your 90s, you start taking a step backward. How old are you? I was just 92. You turned 92 seven months ago, but you're just 92. And then an even stranger thing happens. You know, they say as you get older, you become, a lot of your childhood comes back to you. As soon as you hit 100, you're back into your fractions. You become like a little kid again. How old are you? I'm 100 and a half. <laughs> the challenge is to stay focused throughout. Always remember, if you want to progress in life, don't sweat the small stuff, because anxiety and depression are not sins, but they can get in the way of your grander spiritual ambitions and do more damage than any sin can. Keep cheerful friends. The grouches will always be there to pull you down. Enjoy the simple things and laugh often. Keep learning, as we said before, the connection between brain and soul. And when you think you know it all, learn some more. Never let the brain idle because an idle mind is the devil's workshop. Surround yourself with love and tell the people you love that you love them at every given opportunity. That needs no elaboration. Remember, your life is made up of the people you love and those who love you. Keep that spark, keep that two-way current alive always. And then, above all else, appreciate the beauty and the splendor of every given day. Because life is not measured by the number of breaths that you take, but by the number of moments that take your breath away. Make sure to use those moments by continuously discovering who you are. When you wake in the morning and you open your eyes, you appreciate the grandeur of another day, which in essence is another gift from God that he gave you to yet again discover and be all that you can be, to do all that you can to complete another step in the mission called life and bringing heaven down to earth. We know that in whatever time allocated to us here on earth, we have a purpose to fulfill, to make up every moment of every given day meaningful. Look explore, discover what life still has to offer you, and perhaps more importantly, determine what you still have to offer life. May we all merit success in this endeavor. May you all indeed be trailblazers to the world in this 21st century by making the most of every minute, by transforming, living in the present, launching yourselves in every way, and literally seeking out the eternity in every given moment. And above all else, remember, Life's journey is not to arrive at the grave safely in a well-preserved body, but rather to skid in sideways, totally worn out, shouting, oh yeah, what a ride. May you all enjoy blessings and successes in your lives and merit only goodness forevermore.